So this paper is part of my book project. So I'm giving a chapter, a section in a chapter of a book. <laughs> okay, so this is what you're getting today. Um, I know many of you were at the movie last night on Greenly, and there was one scene in the movie that was shown multiple times. If you didn't see it, I won't ruin it. But if you didn't see it, there's one scene that shows up multiple times, and it's the poor going to get their bowl of grain porridge, their, their mushabit, right? And this grain porridge I'm going to talk briefly about, so I want you to keep that scene in mind if you saw the movie. And if you didn't, just imagine people each day going to get their, their daily sustenance. And, uh, and because they're very hungry, and you know they're very hungry in the movie because they eat it very quickly. The, the movie is very good about that. They come to the line, they get the food, they don't even wait to sit down. They're, it's right away. And that's just supposed to show you how hungry they really are. In a report to the Zurich City Council in 1540, Heinrich Willinger wrote that the country enjoyed unprecedented prosperity. But at the same time, he urged the council to plan ahead for possible difficult times to come. In the 1540s, signs of economic stress began to overwhelm the city's poor relief systems, and the rapidly increasing number of beggars led to the re-examination of poor relief policies. By January of 1544, it was necessary to revise the Alms Order of 1525 for the first time. The first major change revealed that the number of poor people had increased dramatically, as the records indicate that one pot of grain porridge was not enough and had to be doubled to two pots to feed the hungry. The initial response from the council was to limit aid to those who were designated as worthy poor. The council intention was to divide the beggars into three groups according to origin, whether from abroad, whether from within the Swiss Confederation, or whether within their own territory. At this time, the council also renewed an earlier ban limiting the accommodation for foreigners to no more than eight days. As the poor relief system proved to be insufficient for the growing need, ministers became more concerned about the political affairs of poor relief policy. Starting in the 1550s, Bullinger as chief minister applied his reforming mind to the vexing social problem of poverty. On March 7, 1551, Bullinger began vocalizing his critical perspective on the situation before the small council. Informed by his biblical study, years of pastoral experience, and the anxieties of social crises, Bullinger entered the arena of social policy reform. His political speeches mark the lively socio-political life of the church, where the leading pastor would intermittently enter the political decision-making sphere of the council. In his speeches before the council, both in 1550s and later in the 1570s, Bullinger highlighted his concern for effective poor relief in four ways. One, by calling for the right use of church property. Two, I'll, I'll explain these all a little bit more, but I'll just list them out for now. Two, criticizing the moral turpitude that consumed precious resources. Three, advocating for the outlawing of able-bodied begging. And four, proposing job creation programs funded by the city. So the first two concerns, so calling for the right use of church property or criticizing the moral problems, um, those two concerns were already raised earlier in his sermons. You already see them in his sermons. The, the third and fourth concern, they develop as he kind of thinks about practical policies. So advocating for the outline of banking and proposing job creation programs that are funded by the city, those develop as time goes on. 
So let me talk about these four things a bit here. So first, Bullinger and his fellow ministers were consistently critical of what they saw as misguided policies regarding church property. The city ministers reminded the politicians of the promises of the Reformation, which taught that the goods that had formerly served the superstition and the church of splendor should now be awarded to the living saintly poor. Tensions over the use of former church property became apparent in December 1555 when a conflict erupted over pastor <coughs> political preaching criticizing the council's choices. The minister of Tus, Rudolf Husli, was imprisoned in Zurich because he had criticized the council's use of church property in a sermon. Husli was released after two days of detention, but defrocked. On December 16, 1555, Bullinger, accompanied by the other city pastors, came before the council to complain about the handling of this case. He protested not only against the degrading treatment of the pastor, but spoke generally about the use of church property. In this speech, Bullinger made it clear that church property should be used partly for the support of pastors and their households, partly for the maintenance of church buildings, partly for educated <coughs> students, and partly for the care of the poor. His message was clear that the magistrates should not devise other plans for these resources, which were given and dedicated for these ministerial um, purposes. Second, Bullinger expressed his concern for moral <coughs> problems related to begging and poverty. Because excessive gorging, drinking, and gambling were signs of visible consumption that led many people without reserves into poverty, he argued for the enforcement of moral mandates. Since the conspicuous consumption led to impoverishment, this social problem was treated as a moral deficiency associated with wrong behavior. So even into the 1570s, you see Bullinger along with Rudolf Walther, who is Bullinger's successor, they continued to deride sort of moral corruption as one of the root causes of societal problems. For example, in their private report to the Special Commission in uh, 1572, they, they really criticized the increase of taverns and bars because they believed that such businesses add to poverty and begging. Third, in response to the market increase in the number of beggars in the 1540s that I mentioned earlier, Bullinger blamed able-bodied beggars for exacerbating the socioeconomic dilemma of poverty and disorder. Disturbed by those who would take resources needed for the destitute, Bullinger observed, quote, many people who are healthy and fit for work are begging because the <coughs> begging profession has become more profitable than working. In light of limited resources and growing need, Bullinger believed that reducing the number of able-bodied beggars would ultimately lead to the alleviation of poverty. Although Bullinger made a speech compelling the council to take action in 1551, the council still remained relatively, maintained a relatively passive role in combating poverty. The council's treasurer, Jakob Wedmüller, encouraged the council to set up a business to give work to the poor, but this entrepreneurial initiative remained in private hands since the council was only indirectly involved through tax <coughs> rebates. The council's ambivalence between centralization and decentralization of poor relief is evident in their vacillation between prohibition and permission of begging whenever the demands on the resources became too great. So that's one thing that's a little different than the, um, the poor orders that I see in Germany with uh, Johannes Bugenhagen. They're very clear on getting rid of begging from the, from the very beginning. But in Zurich, they sometimes allow it, they sometimes prohibit it, they go back and forth on that. So that's not fully set yet when Bullinger is writing. Nevertheless, both ministers and politicians shared a sense of responsibility for resolving the economic strain of poverty. On March 23, 1558, Bullinger 
initiated a working collaboration with the council members on this matter. Along with six other ministers, he appeared before the council to bring forth a new measure concerning poverty alleviation. He prefaced this proposal with a justification for ministers' engagement in affairs of social policy by drawing on both biblical mandates as well as historical examples. So based on multiple passages in the Bible, such as Romans, Corinthians, Deuteronomy, Acts, 1 Timothy, Matthew, 1 John, Bollinger justifies ministers getting involved in political matters by arguing that the case of the poor is a case for all Christians, especially servants of the church. He included specific examples of the early apostles of Acts who took on the work of caring for the poor. He also gave historical examples of clergy who were in charge of almsgiving since the beginning of the church. Therefore, Bollinger surmised that because the servants of the church had played a pivotal role historically, biblically, integrally, <coughs> ministers to now could establish themselves as rightful authorities on that matter. From a legal standpoint, the ministers had the right to monitor alms accounts and administration of local church property as a measure of accountability. In response to the organized impetus from the ministers, the council immediately formed a commission to treat the proposals and the findings. Like many of his contemporaries, Bullinger distinguished between those who were truly poor because they could not work or earn enough wages versus those who opted for the beggar's profession. This clarification explains why Bullinger sometimes sounds supportive of the poor, while also sometimes deeply critical of them as well. While Bullinger defended the support of the former, the truly poor, he strongly opposed the latter because he saw that begging took away the resources from those who should actually truly receive it. Recognizing growing economic hardships as the number of poor people doubled and then tripled in the span of two to three years, Bullinger outlined his strategic program. Simply put, the strong and healthy beggars will be prohibited from begging. In contrast, the truly needy will be well cared for. Bullinger argued that since begging promoted disruptive and harmful acts such as destructive protests, those who chose begging over other professions would not qualify for this relief. His disdain for begging grew out of his regular observations in the city that beggars seem to waste their money. Bullinger observed, quote, with whatever amount they have begged in the morning, they sit in the streets and the cellars and drink. They linger in places where they can get wine instead of bringing the money home to their children where it could help them. So you see, all around the city and the monasteries, they lay everywhere, having already spent all their money. As Bullinger saw it, many of these beggars added to the disorderly behavior in the streets, since many of them did not live under the discipline or governance of a guild or a profession, but instead they did whatever they wanted and they even taught this to their children. Concerning the number of, the growing number of able-bodied beggars, he urged the council to take action. Bullinger told the council, first of all, to prohibit beggars because they were disruptive to society and to help the truly poor so that there would be no need for begging. <coughs> Whenever the council allowed begging, he argued that it also allowed disruptive behaviors that threatened peaceful order and social stability. While his commentaries focused primarily on his theological reasons for poor relief, Bullinger's sermons straddle theological and social concerns as he exhorted listeners to ethical behaviors. Bullinger's speeches then move forward from the practical applications in his sermons to pastoral advocacy for the poor relief, especially before the council. Those foundational religious values learned from the Bible, plus years of experiential knowledge of poor parishioners, as well as the council's failure to remedy the needs of the poor, empowered Bullinger to call for reform. Before the magistrates, he pinpointed political, economic, and social benefits of poor relief programs. He declared, quote, when you help the truly poor, things remain peaceful and orderly. With 
the added benefit that negative views and criticisms against the magistrates likewise diminish. Effect, what he's saying is, effective poor relief will improve public opinion about city governance. In the last part of his 1558 speech, Bullinger does not forego criticizing the wrongful use of church property. Very early theme continues. In particular, he notes that the failure to use church funds for their intended purposes had resulted in pathetic outcomes. The city had used the money to buy weapons, manufacture ammunition, and pay for the war. So Bullinger remarked that, quote, such spending did not bring much success, since church goods were meant for the poor, not for funding wars. A month later, in April 26, on April 26 of 1558, the minister submitted 10 action points to the special commission formed by the council. Now there was a shift in these April proposals. So it's only one month later, but there's also, there begins to be a shift at this time. And this is one of the things that I, I will argue, I argue in my book. In the March proposals, the focus was that able-bodied beggars should work and the truly poor be supported, which is kind of, a lot of times you hear that throughout these, uh, this time, anytime there's a change in poor relief, it's kind of a common thing to say, right? So in March, they're saying the same thing. But in April, Specific changes demonstrate an effort to make ways for all the poor to be productive. In their concerns about poverty alleviation, in the April action, 10 action points, the ministers address problems of employment, debt, and inflation. And they recognize the need for preventative measures. The ministers assert, <clears throat> quote, because the poor are not a small number, it is highly necessary to see how to provide the poor with labor so they can work and earn a living, whether it be through fabric making or whatever else they could produce. Something that would be approved as desirable and useful, but not too demanding to make. We have some experience with the trade of cloth making spinning yarn and making heavy fabric to know how many can be supported with this. As we already know, yarn weaving now provides for the young and old in Vintatu. Bullinger also argued that the city council should prohibit the unseemly tug of suspicious loans that cause rural residents to take out loans and as a result go into debt. He writes, quote, your honors should not allow people to travel to another region to make money and bring it back, which they then loan to the farmers. Then the land is pawned to the loaner. If the loan is not repaid, the land is never given back to the struggling poor people. This is the main cause of their downfall. Bollinger advocated for government intervention in economic policies that preyed on the vulnerable working poor. Such economic behavior would eventually result in the ownership of these lands accumulating uh, into a few hands, including outsiders beyond the city. Bullinger also called for state intervention in matters of price regulation, particularly for food supplies such as corn and grain. He derided the speculation of high food prices and petitioned the state to open up its stores of grain whenever the prices skyrocketed. The minister's proposal illustrates their development into agents for social change by moving from focusing solely on moral deficiencies and criticism of mismanagement to more practical solutions for poverty reduction and even prevention. According to uh, Bullinger's diaries, Climate change inaugurated a new period of hardships. With the crop failures in 1570, inflation and the lack of food resulted in a growing number of beggars, especially among those who had weak social networks. In 1571, he noted that many would surely die of hunger because of a limited harvest, and he prayed for divine mercy. God, come help us. In such dire circumstances, he also called on the councilmen to join in congregational prayers. Mm -hmm. A drawing 
on the cover of Johannes Jakob Wick's collection depicts this hard winter of 1570 and 1571 with images of a frozen Zurich lake and people falling through the ice while ravenous wolves attack and kill three young female seamstresses. That's actually on the cover of the Church History Journal uh, where I have this a shorter version of this article. In. So if you want to see it, it's on the Church History cover of June 2017. Like many others, Bullinger interpreted this small ice age as a punishment from God and therefore called on believers to pray and live a moral life. Because many perceived the relentless calamities as divine judgment, the council ordered the introduction of a congregational prayer composed by Bullinger for this state of emergency. Bullinger's prayer focused on the plea for mercy against a comprehensive range of afflictions, including inflation, hunger, bad climate, war, and sickness. Faced with mass poverty, he called for special prayer meetings to seek divine intervention in response to this crisis. Bullinger saw poverty as a miserable problem that slyly found new reasons to arise. Prompted by food crises, by colder climate, the ministers and magistrates reviewed policies and revised practices as they continued to seek remedies. The council tried to manage the seriousness of the situation by appointing a new commission in February 24, 1571 to discuss further measures concerning poor leave. However, their discussions did not amount to much change. When a certain helplessness regarding how to proceed arose, a council member approached Bullinger to ask for his advice. This reveals a, a change in the council's earlier, uh, some of the council's earlier attitudes towards ministers. Now the council, driven by the desperate winter of 1570-1571, they turned to their long-standing chief minister for guidance. In May of the same year, Bullinger shifted the target of his criticism from the immoral poor, which he had been doing for many, many years, <clears throat> for decades, right? So his target of criticism moved from the immoral poor now to the immoral rich. of the weak leadership of the magistrates and the upper class. So this time, Bullinger was concerned with the poor example of leadership, and he complained that upper class lifestyle had incited God's wrath. The ministers believed that better discipline would contribute to economic and social stability, and they did, directed this type of moral disciplining not only at able-bodied beggars, but now they were directing it toward their civic leaders whose, in their mind, unethical practice resulted in the depletion of funds. In particular, on May 13th of 1572, Bullinger addressed the suspicions against the Alms Administration Office for economic exploitation by its director, Stoltz. In a time when economic distress was high and poverty threatened the survival of many people, the apparent wealth and opulence of the alms office director seemed puzzling. Bullinger's allegations originated from the mysterious <coughs> enrichment of this former shoemaker who, in his first year as alms director, purchased personal goods costing 700 to 900 pounds, although he had lacked, previously lacked, assets. Suddenly, he could afford to go to Constance to buy expensive leather, which was then processed by his companions, but earlier, he had been barely able to play the tanners in Zurich. Since his new position in the alms administration, he led a complex and costly household. Upon further examination into these allegations, the large council on June 11, 1572, instructed the wardens to make clear to the director that he must keep his private business separate from the alms administration. And he ought not to entertain or utilize the employees from the office for his business. Otherwise, he must resign the office. The verification of this misappropriation of alms funds served as a concrete and egregious example fueling the minister's critique about the misuse of church funds by secular magistrates. 
On August 1520, in August of 1572, the ministers came again before the large councils because of the increasing social and economic hardships within their communities. And they requested a new commission to sit through and thoroughly consider the best decrees. In the following weeks, Bullinger worked on a report which he presented to the commission that had begun to review and update and improve old mandates and old statutes. In addition, Bullinger and Walther, in a private report to the commission, suggested specific proposals for combating poverty and begging, such as providing raw materials, employing the poor, supporting businesses, and buying <coughs> finished products. Bullinger and Walther had increasingly drawn the attention of the magistrates toward this type of assistance. The magistrates had started some efforts toward creating work, but the con pastors continued to put pressure on the council to promote this type of work program. Years earlier, in April 1558, uh, the pastors had indicated for the first time that the way to combat poverty was by finding a way for the poor to earn a living. Hence, Bullinger and Walters focused on linking poverty alleviation with employment. Their proposals offered suggestions for new job opportunities. Now, they were not innovative, not in the sense that no one ever thought of these employment initiatives, but they were innovative in the sense that these initiatives had not been actively pursued as part of a government-supported poor relief program in Zurich. Besides the familiar demands for a strict ban on begging, careful review of authorization of individual alms, and a vigorous crackdown on vices, Bullinger and Walters highlighted a distinctive proposal to organize a government-supported program that simultaneously provided salaries for women and children, work for poor weavers, and clothing for students, orphans, and apprentices. Quote, the women and children should receive working materials to spin and some bread from the city. They would deliver the yarn at a specific time and receive a cash salary as well as new material for processing. The spun yarn should be given to the many poor weavers to weave in the city and countryside. The final product, linen and twill, will annually provide sturdy clothes to the cloisters and hospitals for the orphans, apprentice boys, and others so one could save those costs. The city should sell any remaining cloth so that the profits should at least be the amount needed for the raw materials. Gradually, one could introduce the wool industry together with the silk industry, which could serve as businesses for men and women, young and old. In September 4th, on September 4th of 1572, Bollinger introduced a program that would give poor but able men, women, and children access to employment and earnings in the textile industry and provide vocational training for boys in order to relieve the alms demand. After years of advocating for the needs of the poor, the pastor's proposals signaled the transition to a more thorough examination of the causes of poverty as a way to combat it. Bullinger and Walters also brought into consideration road building as a form of temporary work. And finally, they even suggested the building of workhouses for offenders since able-bodied criminals should not simply be locked up, but rather given some kind of work, such as repairing crumbling roads and buildings. While many of these measures focused on problems in the cities, they also gave attention to the surrounding rural areas. Concerned for the misuse of church resources in the countryside, Bullinger promoted the recording of accounts. He argued that in many places in the countryside, magistrates added ex excessive expenditures to the church expenses by employing those who are not needed, yet still have to be paid and entertained. Bullinger also wished that rural governors would stop augmenting their salaries with additional withdrawals from the church account, mm -hmm. which, they did not, which they did not do at the start of the Reformation. In the proposals for combating pro uh, poverty and begging, begging and Walters called for the rethinking of the monthly or bi-monthly distribution of donations collected in the church cities or city churches for two main reasons. First, the regularly scheduled distribution from the church offerings had caused poor people from all over the countryside to flock to the city to receive the regular monthly handout, thereby overwhelming the city's resources, including the hospital. 
Second, Bullinger saw poor people wasting their money by squandering most of it in the city before they could even get to the countryside. So in response, the commission decided that the donation money collected from the churches would no longer be distributed regularly, but rather would be used sparingly and dispensed only for reasonable requests. This change in policy from regular distribution of handouts to selective distribution by specific request disclosed an ongoing effort to channel financial aid to the deserving poor and a greater intentionality to reduce dependence whenever possible. So in conclusion, in his last years, despite his growing pessimism, Bullinger continued to emphasize the importance of poor relief. In his farewell letter to the magistrates, he urged the counselors to attend to sermons and communal prayers more frequently, as has been done so far by the majority of you. So you assume he's talking to the ones who don't go. He also urged them to help the poor, the foreigners, the widows and the orphans, and graciously care for all the faithful preachers. Quote, for if you treat them badly, you will provoke the wrath of God upon yourself. Bullinger instructed the counselors to ensure that poor relief does not break down, to manage the hospital and poorhouses without overcrowding them, to rightly donate wealth for the truly poor, and to support schools so that God will be honored with it. For Bullinger, these instructions carried religious significance, since those who took pity on the poor would receive mercy from God, while those who turned away from the poor would not have their prayers answered. <clears throat> His underlying rationale for continued attention to poor lay well, included a religious motivation, namely, to be heard by God. Bullinger's advocacy for poor lay was a call to action to accelerate and consolidate a more effective program for poverty eradication. Thank you.